Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing tonight? Um, incredibly sober. Um, doing yeah. Sober October. Yeah. Uh, that's been a journey. Yeah. I uh, found out that CBD sodas have caffeine in them, so that's a tea. Same, I'm wired. I'm so very wired. So I'm drinking some peppermint and sleepy time tea to try and calm down a little bit. I feel like I should take some melatonin like yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I need to chill out <laughs> since I can't take any kind of marijuana products. <laughs> um, since we're doing Sober October, normally I'd rely on that to knock me out tonight, but, um... Tea. Tea is the, tea is the strongest thing. <laughs> tea. Um, <laughs> tea, it's like drag queen lingo. Just what are you it. wearing tonight, Coco? Let's tell the audience. Okay, so I decided to do, um, this take on a 1960s costume, but, like, set in the future. So I'm absolutely dressed like Jane Jetson. Mm. Um, it's just kind of, like... The whole hair and everything. I even painted my skin white. Mmm, nice. <laughs> I, um, I'm a little understated tonight. I am wearing a long duster um, that just, just barely reaches uh, to the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also wearing uh, some grayed hair because I am becoming the full witch lesbian that I wish to become. <laughs> drinking my tea. Um, yeah, I know. It's it's actually, the wig is kind of like getting on me right now. Sorry, it's so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> might be some cat hair in there too. Tea. It's actually made of cat hair. So that, <laughs> that might explain the allergies that you're having. Gosh, so if I sneeze, listeners, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you, so listeners, in the, in the comments below, if you guys liked our coming out stories, uh, we'd love to hear back from you about that. We actually got a lot of positive feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, from those stories, which was actually really cool. On top of the fact that, you know, we were leading up to coming out day and I saw everybody sharing their coming out stories on Facebook. Yeah, so I saw it on Instagram because I'm not on Facebook anymore. Yeah, seriously. Oh gosh, mm-hmm. Facebook has just become a terrible And on place. TikTok. So yeah, I'm only on Instagram and, and TikTok anymore. Gosh, I love um, me some TikTok. I get stuck in those holes. I will be up till three in the morning. <laughs> On TikTok accidentally. <laughs> yeah. I just like blink and realize I was like, these one minute videos took me through three hours. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, all of a sudden there's daylight peeking through my window. Okay. <laughs> Probably best I get some sleep. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, so today's episode, like we finally promised you guys, because we've been saying it for probably about two months now, we wanted to do a series about true crime, and we we're going to do mm-hmm. a full month of true crime, true crime podcast. Yeah. So, well, actually, not a full month, just four weeks. Yeah, we're um, going to do four weeks of different stories that we're going to tell. Um, I think we brought up the possibility of having Shandy Evans on to tell a story. Yeah, we definitely. just have to let her know in advance. Let's. Let's make her, like, one of the later weeks so then she has time to prepare a story. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, yeah, she's also one of the queens uh, here in the city that's really into true crime like Coco and I are. Yes. Um, I don't think Coco and I realized that we had a mutual um, interest in true crime until, like, this year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and actually, the funny thing is, actually, Donna was the one who actually turned me on to true crime. Like, yeah. several years ago, so... Wow, I'm making, it really wasn't that long. Maybe mm-hmm. like a year and a half ago or maybe two years ago, Donna was like, oh yeah, I listen to True, Pri- True Crime Podcast. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was caught up on Welcome to Night Vale, which is one of my favorite podcasts oh, in the world. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, so, and I, I still yeah. listen to it. It's so good. Um, but I was like, Donna, I was like, I'm done. And she's like, oh, I listen to this True, I listen to True Crime Podcast. It was Dr. Death, I think, is the one that I was listening to at the time when I was telling you okay. about it. And that yeah. was back in Colorado. So yeah, yeah, it has been over a year. Yeah, it's but... been well over a year. And yeah. and so that's what uh, turned me on to True Crime. And, and I guess like to, because you know, this is like a drag related podcast. Mm-hmm. So let's just real briefly. So Donna, just explain what a True Crime Podcast podcast is for our listeners essentially i mean i i grew up watching shows like unsolved mysteries Mm. so it's basically that in an audio format um you get to listen to some mysteries that are unsolved some that have come to resolutions and um it's basically a way for people to tell different stories bring awareness to certain cases Mm -hmm. and um different causes um And actually, I think true crime, although we're dealing with highly sensitive subject matter when talking about these cases, I think that it has a real benefit because um, for the unsolved cases especially, it can um, 
have more evidence come to light because people hear about it and it brings more awareness to the case. And um, yeah, yeah, visibility, yeah. visibility, visibility, definitely. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, some of the disclaimers for this is um, I actually um, I'm the listener this week, so I have no idea actually what Donna is going to be talking about in her mm-hmm. story. However, I do always want to preface that um, we are trying to be as respectful as we can to any persons involved in any of the stories. Um, we do hope that it does bring some visibility if it is an unsolved case. And we will try to use terms that are more appropriate as we go through this. And if we do make any missteps, remember that we are new to true crime. And please let us know in the comments. Like if we yeah. really mess up or we mispronounce something or whatever, just let us know. We'd like to get better at this. And maybe we'll do it once a month where we do a true crime, whatever. Yeah. We'll see. Um, I do want to preface this story tonight with a, a, a trigger warning. Um, this story has some extremely graphic instances of violence so listener discretion is advised um it has uh an instance of uh violence against a trans individual and um murder of a trans individual and uh these can be extremely triggering because of the amount of violence that trans people and people in the lgbt community face um, on a daily basis and especially in the climate that we're in with um, the administration that we have. Um, Even with the pandemic that we've been having, there's still been a large amount of um, trans women and trans men and LGBT folks that have faced violence at the hands of hateful people. Um, So this can be triggering for people that have experienced that. And I just want to preface the story with that. so if that is something that could affect you, um, this may not be the best episode for you to listen to, and we just want to be sensitive about that. Definitely. We um, love you, listeners. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to get right into it. So tonight, um, this this case is solved, and this case did come to a resolution, and it was it gained a lot of notoriety because of the resolution that it had, and we will get to that. But the case tonight is the case of the murder of Mercedes Williamson. She was a Alabama trans teen. Um, Her aunt describes her as being very fun-loving, honest, and strong-headed. When Mercedes came out at the age of 14 as a trans woman, um, her dad disowned her, but people in her family, like her aunt, her cousin, and her mother, accepted her and just wanted her to be happy. And this was extremely hard, especially being a trans teen from Alabama coming out. So, and this was back in the mid-2000s. This The story takes place in 2015 when Mercedes was 17 years old. Some other background about Mercedes. Mercedes had really big dreams for herself. Uh, she wanted to move to California and she her dream was to do makeup for celebrities. When she would talk to her aunt and her cousin, she would say things like, oh, I could I could make them up better. Like, imagine mm. what I could do if I had that opportunity. So mm. she had sights set on um, moving to L.A. and uh, doing makeup for the stars. And that That's was one so of her cool. dreams. So the story starts uh, when Mercedes came into contact with a 27-year-old man. So 10 years older than her. His name was Josh Fallum. And they came into contact on Facebook initially. And they would eventually meet up in real life and spend a few months dating, uh, getting to know one another. Mm -hmm. The real tragedy occurs on May 30th, 2015, when Josh picked up Mercedes as she was walking on the side of the road in what Josh would describe as a chance encounter. Uh, They had been out of contact now and kind of stopped dating and broken up for a couple of months now. And Josh came upon Mercedes as she was walking on the road. And um, unfortunately, after May 30th, Mercedes would never be seen alive again. Oh, wow. So two days later in George County, Mississippi, Josh Fallon's dad uh, actually called saying that he had believed his son had murdered someone on his property. This is when police came to Josh Fallon's dad's property and the body of mercedes was discovered loosely covered in vegetation That's um, strange. and 
her body was described in being such graphic condition that she had such severe blunt force trauma to the head that it was impossible to identify her on site. Oh my God. Um, Police described the scene as extremely horrific. Um, On June 2nd, Josh's father brought him in to turn himself in. And Josh would then make claims that although he and Mercedes had dated prior to this encounter, Mm -hmm. they had never had a sexual relationship. And Mercedes was someone that he had grown increasingly fond over uh, as they had seen each other when they were dating. Initially, investigators thought this was clearly a crime of passion. Uh, He claimed in interrogation, I didn't know that they weren't the person they thought they were. Oh, wow. And that prior to uh, then, all they had ever done was kiss. Uh, He claimed Mm. that... He claimed that day that he saw her walking on the side of the road and he had picked her up and he made his intentions clear that he wanted to uh, basically take this relationship that they had been having to the next level, um, that he wanted to have sex. Oh, wow. And in his confession, Josh would try and claim the trans panic defense saying that he blacked out after realizing Mercedes Mercedes was trans and that that is what led him to brutally murder her. Oh, um, when he came to, he was standing over Mercedes with a hammer in his hand. Um, there was a problem with Josh's story, though. Testimony from Mercedes' neighbor and close friends would reveal that Josh was well aware of Mercedes' identity. Oh, God. And that the two had previously had a sexual relationship months before May 30th, 2015. I wonder how they knew that. So it wasn't until after Josh's confession that they discovered this. Oh, wow. So while he's sitting there being interrogated, he is telling them that, you know, I I had never known this. You know, he was trying to claim trans panic, as we've seen done in so many cases um for our new listeners what is trans panic trans panic is i mean it's essentially in line with if you're familiar with the term the gay panic defense josh it's it's a defense that's been used in in cases and unfortunately been successful in a lot of cases where the person who is having a sexual encounter with the other individual um claims to have no prior knowledge of of the identity of the person that they are having sexual intimacy with. They tried to actually use the gay panic defense and the murder of Matthew Shepard, actually. They did. Um, yes. And the only reason they didn't get away with it is because they picked him up from the bar and drove a distance away. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it didn't work because you can't be surprised in a car ride for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So... I mean, Josh thought that he was going to get away scot-free using this defense. Um, But we'll soon find out that there was a lot more to the case than Josh was letting on. And with that, I need to mention, Donna, how are you doing this evening? Well, Coco, I'll let you know after this brief commercial break. Hey all you beauties, this is Manhattan Brown, Eugene's bearded lady, with a special message. Do you love podcasting queers, queer issues and themes? Well check out Queer With Attitude on your podcast app for a new obsession that focuses on tearing down the societal norms in the LGBTQIA plus community with weekly guests, creative writing, and a special cocktail of the week designed by mixologist Brian Peterson. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and other podcasting apps, or you can check us out at anchor.fm backslash queerwithattitude to see where to find us and to become a monthly sponsor. Join the queer revolution to educate, create, and inspire. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna Telepodcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast Check it out. with Coco and Donna Tell a podcast. Check it out. Coco, I am 
in a bit of a somber mood because we are dealing with some serious subject matter um, in this episode of our podcast, but um, I feel that it's important that we bring awareness to these stories. And we left off kind of talking about the gay panic defense and why it didn't work for this case. So you have some statistics in front of you about the gay panic defense. So let's go into that a little bit before we continue. Yeah, so a study tracked that 104 cases between 1970 and present day um, have used the gay panic defense. And so, and then also the article also lets us know in about one third of the cases, charges are reduced for defendants who use the gay panic defense. So literally saying, I mean, in point blank, easy language, um, well, I didn't know that they were gay and I murdered them. And they're like, oh, okay, well, maybe just a slap on the wrist and maybe some community service. Obviously not to that degree, but that's that's literally what they're saying, that the charges are sometimes lessened because of it. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, multiple witnesses came forward after Josh's confession and said that they had even heard the two having a sexual relationship. Mm. Uh, It came out in Josh's confession that he was a member of the Latin Kings gang, and this would be a really important detail as to what his motive truly was in this case. Uh, Josh brought up a phone that he had at his place, um, and that there would be more information as to who Mercedes was based off of their interactions on his phone. What Josh did also by bringing up this phone was he would basically out himself. Uh, And on his phone, authorities found hundreds of pictures of male-on-male pornography and male genitalia. You you wouldn't be panicked from discovering that if that's something that is part of your history. And actually, it's something that's interesting, too. We even say nowadays that, um, like, people try to say that even if you are attracted to, so you say you're identifying as a straight man, but you're looking at gay porn, and you're dating a trans woman to, like, have the best of both worlds or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, the gay panic defense is still technically used because they're like, well, you know, I... I was attracted to women, I'm attracted to men, I guess, or whatever, Mm -hmm. but I'm not attracted to both. Yeah. And um, so, and what's really uncomfortable about that is that it's still a form of fetishization, kind of. Yeah. Like, and so the defense is still tried to, is still used in that capacity. And that's really uncomfortable because once we should, obviously we should, we should respect trans bodies as as they are. Yeah. And that's going to be something important to get into when we learn more about this motive. So law enforcement would later do a search of one of the gang members' homes and found a binder full of the gang's bylaws. In these bylaws, um, one of them was no member should be involved in homosexual activities. Oh, no. So although what we would see as not homosexual because Mercedes was a trans woman, right? Um, the gang did not have such forward-thinking ideas. And... Neither did Josh himself, it turns out, because of what he did to Mercedes. Wow. Uh, The police questioned one of Josh's fellow gang members, and he turned over a photo of Josh and Mercedes at a Latin Kings beach party months before Mercedes was murdered. So she had been in the group with them as they were dating. And the gang member claimed that he asked Josh if he was sure that Mercedes wasn't born male because he noticed an Adam's apple. And this is something that caused Josh to panic, essentially. Mm. Even though he told the gang member, no, she may have some hormonal problems, but, and um, that's, you know, this is my girlfriend. He knew that the gang was catching on to him. And this scared Josh. Uh, The police concluded that... A violation of these bylaws would give the gang a kill on sight order for Josh, thus giving him the motive to tase, stab, and beat Mercedes to death on his father's property on May 30th. Oh my god. So Josh then pled guilty to first degree murder, not going to trial because he didn't want to involve the Latin Kings um, and he didn't want to get them basically to know the truth. 
about what had happened. I guess what's really confusing about that is I don't understand why... I don't understand why it was so violent. Yeah. I mean, if he's already looking... I mean, I know... There is this thing where when people have a fetish... Yeah. Or even not, really. They have an interest. Yeah. That they That's not public knowledge. Mm-hmm. And they can actually lash out at it. But uh, the thing about it with it being a person, and a person you're romantically involved with, and have some sort of feelings for, obviously, because yeah. this was well, according to witness accounts. Witnesses said that they t- told each other they loved each other all the time. So, so this... To, I think the reason why it could have been so violent was because it was a crime of passion. And I I don't know. It's it's hard to say why it was so brutal. Well, and it's, it's really hard to imagine um, abuse in relationships because we don't like, I don't know if you have any information on whether or not the relationship was abusive in any capacity beforehand. Mm-hmm. But all of that from the police reports, uh, that's really graphic and horrible i don't know how you could do that to anyone that you care about it is important to note too that josh had been to prison prior to him and mercedes dating and had a past of violent gang history you know had had been involved in crime um so then josh maybe. by no means was a he, perfect, was no, he was no saint. he was no prince you know <laughs> um josh josh had his slew of issues and unfortunately, 17-year-old Mercedes got involved with this man because she wanted to be loved. And he told her that he loved her and showed her that affection. And, you know, I'm sure that's something that she wanted in her life, you know. And it just happened to be with the very wrongest of wrong people. So, um... Mercedes caught on that she was being set up while she was in the car. Josh later told um, someone who was interviewing him after pleading guilty to first degree murder. So she was catching on that it was a setup while she was in the car and actually tried to be tried to escape um, through the passenger's door through the passenger side after being stabbed. So she had been tased and stabbed and was trying to escape and Josh caught up with her as she was trying to escape. And that's Gosh. when he had the claw hammer and um, beat her over the head with the claw hammer multiple times. And that's when her face basically became unrecognizable um, because he wanted to ensure that she would not survive this encounter. And so Josh, after pleading guilty to first degree murder, would not only be sentenced for that, but he would also be tried and found guilty under the 2009 Matthew Shepard and James Boyd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act. So the reason why this story has so much notoriety is because he was the first person to ever be tried for a specifically transphobic attack under that act. Oh, wow. And he was found guilty. This is a federal crime. That act is a federal crime. In many states, like Mississippi, they don't have any hate crime statutes. So on a state level, Josh never would have been found guilty. I have to, I do have to go back and mention that although Mercedes was from Alabama, Josh's dad's property was in Mississippi. So she was killed in Mississippi. Okay. Um, so yeah, in, in states like Mississippi, there are no hate crime statutes. So he was charged on a federal level with a hate crime because of that act. Because of the James Boyd Jr. and Matthew Shepard um, Hate Crime Prevention Act. Wow. So, yeah. And this is, I think, something that's incredibly important to bring up. Because of acts like that, um, justice truly can be sought for people who are killed simply because of who they are. And although they had had a relationship prior to it, Mercedes was killed in cold blood for no other reason than the fact that she was a trans woman. And and it was okay that she was trans until other people knew about mm-hmm. it, which is kind of what makes it even worse. Yeah. It was like, yeah. oh no, we can have some sort of relation. And that's a very young age, yeah. too. Yeah, it's a very young age. She was 17 years old. And him being 10 years older than her... You know, I'm sure that she felt included and she felt safe when he was bringing her into those circles. Right. And, um, you know, although I'm sure it was, there was a level of danger being involved, 
and um, having to have that secret, she felt that she was with someone that she trusted. And right. um, that's, I think, the the saddest thing about it. So the thing with this, too, is that trans women are the largest demographic to be victims of murder um, when it comes to the LGBT community. Um, according to GLAAD, uh, black trans women make up 80% of murder victims, while Latinx trans women make up about 10%, with indigenous and white women making both up 5%, so 10% in total. Um, Mercedes was not um, black, Mercedes was white. Um, but I want to take some time. Also, there is a memorial page for Mercedes Williamson um, on Facebook. There's a way to honor her and keep her memory alive by um, having that Facebook page. And uh, that's where, you know, her family is able to remember her. And um, basically, I want to bring up another case. Um, this The story of Mercedes is, is incredibly sad, and it is fortunate that justice was served in this case, but that family will never be able to have their daughter back. Um, wow. That mom's only child is now gone forever because of this man. And I think that it's important that justice was served, but so sad that that family um, has to go on without Mercedes now because of him. That is heartbreaking. I wonder how accepting her family was. Uh, her aunt, so I, I watched interviews and her aunt and her cousin were primarily interviewed. Her mom, obviously, I think this was a very sensitive topic for her to be discussing. So um, there's a whole video on Mercedes' case on Crime Watch Daily. You can watch it on YouTube. There's three parts to it. And there's also just a full 20 minute long video that kind of details the case and shows you pictures. You'll get to see who Mercedes was as a person if you watch that video. Um but yeah, her, her aunt was extremely accepting. And that's surprising for a Southern family, you know? You don't really get that from relatives being so accepting. And her aunt and cousin really loved her. And you could tell that she was extremely loved and cared for by that side of her family, even though she had been disowned by her dad for coming out as trans. Um, I'm assuming he's still in jail today then. Yes, yes. Uh, he'll be in jail for the rest of his life. Um, because he was tried not only for murder in the first degree, but also under that hate crime act. Um, okay. I, I don't think Josh will ever be released and he shouldn't ever be released. Agreed. Um, he does talk about how he regrets it a lot of the time when he's interviewed about it and mm. he, how, how he wishes that he didn't do it, but, uh, he can't take that back. He, he did that to her. Well, we find that, um, in all the true, true crime podcasts that I've listened to, that sometimes murderers will try to get public sympathy because they want somebody to take up their case yeah. and retry it. Um, we also find that um, it can also lead to people like fetishizing their criminals criminals in jail mm -hmm. um, to like send them things or make their lives easier or stuff like that. And so the I, it could be performative or it could be that he truly regrets it now after spending um, a number of years in prison. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I do want to bring up, so the thing with the statistics that I just listed, I think that it would be a disservice to not bring up a current case that's unsolved. Um, mm. The unfortunate thing about this case, I wanted to make this episode primarily about this case when I was doing research, but unfortunately there's just so little details. Um, I want to bring some attention to this case. Um, Misha Caldwell, uh, 41 years old, this is an unsolved murder that also happened in Mississippi. Um, Mississippi, for some reason, really, um, I, I have a lot of connection to it because my dad's side of the family, I don't know if you ever knew this, but my dad's side of the family, I, I think I have told you, um, is from Mississippi. Oh, um, I think I knew that. And um, it's, it's not, I've, I've been there as a kid. It's not a place that um, you ever want to be openly queer at um, because it is uh, very, very red everywhere you go. Yikes. Um, and Yikes. I even, you know, from my family experienced, you know, how rampantly uh, prejudiced they could be. Yikes. And, you know, it's it's a scary place to be queer. And it's a scary place to be a queer person of color. But I want to talk about Misha Caldwell. I believe that's how you say, say her name. It's M-E-S-H-A. Um, she was 41 years old uh, when she was killed. 
And like I said, there's not a lot of information on this case because, uh, unfortunately, I don't think that there's been a whole lot of investigating done mm -hmm. as to what happened the night that Misha was killed. Um, she was killed on January 4th, 2017. 2017 was, at the time, a record high year for murders of trans women. Mm -hmm. um, Misha was um, killed in Canton, Mississippi. She was shot multiple times and found at the end of a road uh, in Madison County. Uh, Misha is described as being an incredibly kind and popular person. Uh, she had family in the drag scene. There, there mm -hmm. is a drag scene in Mississippi, believe it or not. Um, and she had family in there. She was, she was someone who did hair and makeup and, um, you know, really had that chosen LGBT family in the Deep South. Um, mm. I bring up Misha's case because, unfortunately, like I said, black trans women make up the largest demographic of women that are murdered um, mm -hmm. in these crimes. And a lot of the times, there's not a lot that happens with their cases. A lot of the times, they are unsolved. I first learned of Misha's case by going to a blog site called Trans True Crime, and she was one of the victims that stuck out to me. Her case was so short, but it was the fact that it took place in Mississippi that it kind of stood out, and I wanted to bring some awareness. So um, it's a really important case just to like do more researching, and I think it's grassroots movements like these that really bring attention to these types of cases. So with cases like Misha, we don't want her to go forgotten um, just because there's little details about her case. We want her to be remembered and to be celebrated because she, she was an important person and she was loved and she had family. And there are not many details of what happened to Misha that night. In fact, there's not even really many details on the caliber of gun that was used. Um, to, to kill her when normally this is these are things that would you know be released for a case um so i really think it's important that we tell these people's stories because they were beautiful people who existed um and misha also deserves to have her story told regardless right. of how little details there are for her well and what i recognize too about some of the trans killings that happen is that Oftentimes, sometimes they go underreported mainly because um, there wasn't like because you have to remember coming out of the closet because coming out of the closet as trans is a big deal to people and they might not have families that are pushing for that information. I'm not saying that's yeah. what happened. That's what's happening here. But some of the time what you're seeing is um, it's the nature of being in the closet like some people don't report things at the level that they need to it it has kind of this alienating lifestyle in certain circumstances because mm -hmm. in black communities especially um trans is still really difficult um yeah. it's a really difficult sell honestly to a lot of traditional black families yeah and so i the thing is i'm not sure if that's what happened in this case but it's it, it's one of those things of where that's why it's even more important to give it attention because we don't know the circumstances, all the ins mm -hmm. and outs of the family and community dynamics. Yeah, definitely. So, so we can hopefully, hopefully bring some resolution in general. Yeah, definitely. Um, looking into Misha's case, I believe that Misha was somewhat supported by her family. However, looking into a lot of these cases from uh, trans women of color, specifically black mm -hmm. trans women that have been murdered, there were cases when a lot of the times the victims are buried um, as their dead names and oh, um, yes. their gender transition, anything that has, has um, any changes they've made to themselves are, are masked when they're buried. Do you want to explain to our listeners what a dead name is? Yeah, so a dead name is the name that you went bo went for uh, went by before you came out as trans. Yeah, and it's the name that you're well, because obviously we say assigned at birth a lot yeah. with trans people. Yeah. Um, because technically you're assigned a name at birth and you're assigned a gender at birth. Mm -hmm. Um, so a dead name, yes, is the name you were given that the name you were assigned at birth. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I really encourage our listeners to go check out some of these blog sites. I think the site that I that I learned about Misha's case was just on this site called Trans True Crime. And there were a variety of cases, some which were solved, some mm -hmm. uh, many of which were unsolved because of the lack of details that um, exist in the case. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was really surprised by the lack of details behind some of these cases. And um, noticing Misha's being the shortest on that site, I wanted to draw some attention to it. Um, also because it took place in Mississippi just two years after Mercedes was murdered. Gosh, and that's so sad. Yeah. Un- unfortunately, there is no justice for Misha today. Um, and hopefully that's something that can happen. Hopefully there's enough pressure that could be put on by authorities to open up the case and not let it go cold. Mm -hmm. And hopefully um, people can bring attention to it. Um, So, you know, that's about calling the authorities in these places and asking, you know, about these details and asking what is being done to solve these murders um, of these women. Because it truly is an awful, awful, like, set of circumstances that happens for trans women of color and it's it's um it's just a terrible pattern that happens it's heartbreaking Mm -hmm. and we also have to remember too that um with these stories that we're going to be sharing that you can make a difference Mm -hmm. there are like donna said there are facebook groups that usually get created and there are places that you can show your support because a lot of what gets a case reopened or a case looked at is um, public attention. Yeah, public attention and pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the most important thing in these cases. And I think that's the reason why Coco and I actually really feel drawn to true crime in a lot of ways. Um, it's it's good to hear these people's stories being told and for their legacy to live on. Um, although they're are some awful circumstances that surround their names. Um, We want to celebrate these people because they were beautiful people who had full lives ahead of them still to live. And unfortunately, they were cut short by hateful individuals um, that just uh, really, you know, had had bad intentions. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's our job as people who are interested in true crime to not uh, make this sensationalized. We don't want to sensationalize these stories. We want to bring attention to these causes. Um, And that is why we tell these stories. So I think that this is probably a good time to end the episode. Um, I want to thank all of our listeners for listening to this. As Coco said earlier in the episode, we will be having a full month of true crime. And we want to bring as much awareness to these stories as we can as we come up with them. And I want everybody to recognize there's a clear difference in one specific point in the story that we sh- the stories we shared today. Um, sometimes, and especially for some of the listeners I know we do have, um, w- what's counted as a murder, um, a trans murder, isn't necessarily someone who was murdered for being trans. It might be a trans person was also just murdered. But when, but let's think about that in a bigger spectrum, mm-hmm. like is a trans person more likely to be murdered in a circumstance than a cis person would have been in Mm -hmm. that same exact set of circumstances yeah and that's that's where the statistic comes from so it's not that because so don't ask the question um was um oh it's because they were trans or why did it really play into that We just have to really recognize if a cis person, cisgender person, was in this exact same position, would they have been murdered? In the first case that Donna talked about, the answer would have been no. Yeah. To be honest. It would have have been no. Yeah. Had Mercedes not been trans, that, you know, that situation never would have happened. Exactly. And that's the world that we live in and we need to recognize that. It is. And so, yes, that does bring us to the end of our episode. Um, I hope that people gained a lot from this. Um, also, just like in the comments, I know just on a little lighter of subject, just mm-hmm. let everybody know how like you how Donna did telling, telling her first true crime story yes. on a podcast. Yeah. Um, I think feedback is going to be really important because maybe we will do it like once a month or whatever. Yeah. Um, give us gives ourselves some more time to come up with some. Uh, to write our stories. Yeah. And... Oh, believe me. I had so many different stories I wanted to tell. Um, the initial story that I had was a little bit too dark to start with. Um, <laughs> it is one that I would like to tell because it is one about a serial murderer mm-hmm. that um, was homosexual. Um, but I wanted to start this off on a more sensitive note and really bring some awareness to the victims that we talked about tonight. Yeah, and I'll be posting some pictures to our website um, with pictures of the people that Donna talked about in her story. And um, 
not necessarily link to any of the references. I'm not going to do that. That's a lot of work. But mm-hmm. I will definitely post some pictures on our website for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for listening tonight, everyone. Uh, this has been a Gem of a Secret podcast. You can catch us every week um, on Thursdays. Yeah, at www.agemofasecretpodcast.com. That's a www.agemofasecretpodcast.com. Com. Please make sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts. That helps us out a lot. Yep. All right. We will see you next week, listeners. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.